feel like I've been here before. <laughs> All right, so um, I'm going to tell you a bit about how uh, I and, as I mentioned, 22 of uh, my closest friends at Makani Power are inventing a new kind of wind turbine. And I'm also going to tell you a bit about the process we've gone through to develop this device, because I think it's kind of informative of the process of hardware innovation. So when you're trying to make something new, uh, it's good to look at what's out there. And actually, there's this place called Altamont Pass, which is uh, about a 90-minute drive from our offices in uh, the, the Bay Area in California. And you can go out there, and you can see all these old wind turbines. And you can see all the different things people have tried. And they tried just tons of different designs. So there's three-bladed downwind turbines. There's upwind turbines. There's these things that look kind of like egg beaters. They're called Darius turbines. There's this thing that you see in the lower right-hand corner here. Uh, it has wires that hold the blades in place and what looks like little pinwheels that keep the, the rotors pointed into the wind. So people tried all these different things, um, and some of them worked and some of them didn't, and the people that uh, made the things that worked, they kept doing that. The, the ones that didn't, those people copied the ones who were doing things that worked. They probably added more innovations. And what you get to in the end is all this work and this collaboration, everyone converged onto one design, and that's the three-bladed upwind turbine like I have in the picture here. Um, and I actually think these are great devices. Um, and uh, right now, they're the cheapest form of renewable energy. Uh, so to, to do better than that is quite a, um, it's, it's quite a task. Um, and I guess I can say on this, on this process of innovation, um, this is, by the way, very similar to any other complex project. We're at an aeronautical university, so let's bring up commercial aircraft. Uh, you look at these, they're all the same. People aren't building things that look the same because uh, they're lazy. They're doing it because simulating and modeling uh, while an important part of developing new things isn't enough. The world does not, uh, we are not so smart that we fully understand the world. Uh, so, uh, you know, if people want to make something that works at the end of the day, you can only do so by building on experience. Um, so, back to wind. Um, wind power is great, as I said. However, it has this problem that it's still uh, just slightly more expensive than all of the non-renewable sources out there. So, I have this plot here. Uh, in red are all the years where there was not this small subsidy for wind, and in blue are all the years where there was a subsidy. So the little subsidi uh, subsidy, wind does great, um, the wrong people don't agree in Congress, and it just dies. And actually, we had this happen again this year. So we've gone from an estimated 8,000 uh, megawatts installed last year to projected in 2013, zero. Um, so this brings us to the Makani power. Um, Makani was founded uh, when the uh, smart, forward-looking, and I'd say um, somewhat technophilic guys at Google said, um, hey, we love wind power, but um, could you just go ahead and make it half the price and twice as reliable? Uh, so that's a bit of a tall order. Um, and so we, we approached the problem basically um, thinking about a wind turbine. Um, if you look at a wind turbine, you make most of the power with the outside segment of the blade. So if you have a 50-meter blade, the outer 25 meters are making most of the power. Now, this conversion of aerodynamic energy, of kinetic energy in the wind, uh, into um, electrical energy uh, can only be done by carrying that force through the blade. So the blade has to be really heavy to carry that load to the hub. And then the hub has to be really heavy, and the gearbox, and then the cell have to be really heavy to carry that power into the generator and carry the other loads into the tower. The tower has to be really big and heavy to keep the whole thing from tipping over um, and to support all those loads. And then you have to put that whole thing on a really big foundation. Uh, and on top of that, let's say you want to put these things offshore where the wind is more consistent and where you don't have to look at them. There's plenty of space out there, as we saw in the, the earlier talks today. Well, water is kind of slippery compared to dirt, so you need a really big foundation um, to, uh, to do that. And again, if you look at this turbine, the part that's actually doing work is just this little bit. It's just the tips of the blades. And all the rest of this is kind of just along for the ride. So what can we do to get rid of the rest of the turbine? And the idea that we happened upon is to resolve those forces with the tether. So rather than convey a load, we have this blade. Rather than to bend the blade, to convey a load, aerodynamic load through the blade, through the nacelle, and through the tower, we convey it through a tether. And then we tie that tether to something in the ocean or on the ground. And it's not the perfect solution. There still are other things uh, besides this segment of blade that's converting aerodynamic energy into mechanical energy. 
but it's much better than, than, the, uh, than what's out there right now. So the first way that, um, that we tried this was actually with soft kites. And this is the sort of technology that I think uh, Silicon Valley types will really like. It's very iterative. We could actually get a new prototype in a week for $300 uh, on a totally new design. Uh, and it's very easy to prototype. So we can take these kites and hand launch them. It's very easy to get up and, and testing and get out and experience the real world and see the challenges that, that really exist outside of the computer. Uh, and it also has the advantage of being really soft and fluffy and kind of visually appealing. And Makani had a lot of success with this that way, um, and actually managed to uh, fly some 36-hour, totally autonomous, power-generating flights with soft wings. But there's also some challenges to this sort of technology. One is that it's very hard to model. So one of the things that happens is uh, you build your 10 square meter kite and you get it working great, and you want to go build something that's 300 square meters and big enough to actually address some of this uh, you know, real energy output. And you do that and it behaves totally differently and it's extremely hard to figure out how it will behave. So once you scale up, all bets are off and you're kind of just doing the same thing, you know, the same development process again. It also has this problem that when conditions are not good, maybe the wind's a little high, they're a little fragile. So here's one that just exploded midair, not even reeling it in or trying to load it up just because the winds were too high for the device. So after that point, we realized, okay, this, this, this approach is very good to experiment with it. Uh, we don't think it's going to work. And the next thing that we tried was we actually tried uh, kind of the opposite approach. And we went a very aerospace uh, approach. We designed and built a very high performance rigid wing in simulation. Uh, well, sorry, I should say we did all the uh, design work in simulation. We, we, we actually built it in real, you know, you can only, yeah, only build in real life. Um, and we, we, we built this thing. Um, with active controls, uh, it has to have everything working to get this extremely high performance out, uh, but on paper, theoretically, extremely good. But what happens with all projects like this? Well, uh, inevitably, something goes wrong, and uh, it can be a sensor being off. In this case, it was one integrator that was not zeroed in the control system, and then the things that happen are not so great. So at this point, um, we took a different approach. And that was to go back to this sort of iterative, very classic aircraft design approach, which says, why don't you go and you, you copy what everyone else does because it already works. The problem is no one out there builds airborne wind turbines, so we can't very well copy that. So we had to do it ourselves. And what we set out to do was to iteratively uh, experiment and of course, you know, modeling and simulating as well, but ex experiment and, and build up the knowledge base, the intuition, the design sense to make these devices and make them actually work. And we started a very simple design. Now this, this wing, uh, it just looks like a big RC plane. It's about 12 or 15 feet across. Um, but this is designed as an airborne wind turbine and it's actually focused on one thing, uh, which is very robust power generating loops. And in fact, when we designed it, we didn't even know how we were gonna put it in the air. Uh, and this is actually, I think, exemplifies some of the problems you come across when you're trying to make new hardware, which is that 99% of the problems you solve are not the problems that you're going to have you know, in the final product. They're the things you have to do to learn the challenges. So what we did was we invented this, this pneumatic launcher um, to, to launch the wing. And here you see us trying it out before we put the wing on it. Uh, that was a fun day. Um, and then. You know, we, we, we solve these problems, these sort of everyday challenges that come across, um, and then we use them. So here's the wing being launched, this pneumatic launcher, to get it up into crossman flight so that we can actually learn about the problem and gain the experience necessary to build real hardware. And it, the goal with this wing was to make it very reliable. It was to make it extremely robust. You want to make it so you can remove almost all the sensors, you can uh, remove almost all the servos, totally change the wind direction, have it fly on just as happily as ever. And right now, this video, this is very exciting because this was our first crosswind flight with this, and it worked perfectly. And that's not so much because we did a great job of making everything, uh, squeezing every ounce of performance out of it. We did a great job of covering all our bases and making sure that when things break or don't work exactly as you model, that it still behaves the way you want it to. So this is great. We made a lot of progress with that model. But there's one thing it doesn't do, which is generate power. 
the way a wind turbine generates power is there's force on the blades, there's aerodynamic loads, and the blades are spinning at some velocity, and some component of this force is, is towing the blades around. It's just torquing it around in a circle, and this is turning the generator at the hub. Well, uh, if you remember, we, we erased that part of the turbine, so we can't do that anymore. Uh, so what we can do is uh, put these little turbines on the wing, and so the wing, this wing is still just a segment of a blade, and it's still getting pulled around this loop by the air. Uh, and instead of turning some generator at a hub, we put small turbines on the wing. Because the thing is flying fast, it's, it's like trying to generate power in a hurricane. You need a very small turbine to get the power out. So each of these generates is, is generators is uh, generating power uh, and uh, shipping it down the tether at a high voltage. So there's our solution. Of course, then we have to go build it. So this is our prototype. And you can see us take this prototype and test it. So this one, we still didn't have a way to get it in the air that we thought would be viable as a product. But uh, what we were able to do with this is get it up in the air and really learn about power generation and learn about all the problems that have to be solved and all the optimizations you can do to make the power output higher. Um, so, and this still isn't the end. Okay, so we've solved this problem of power generation. And the next thing is how to launch and land. A wind turbine, you can turn it off and it sits there. Uh, that's a pretty easy way to, to, to handle um, no wind. Uh, with us, we can't do that. It's, it's, uh, it's a flight vehicle, so you have to bring it back to the ground somehow. And what we do is hit the wrong button. There we go. And what we do, uh, it's a very complicated control. I have like a different button for every slide, just to keep me on my toes, I guess. Um, what we do is uh, uh, we actually use these uh, turbines and we design them to provide static thrust. So they're a little less efficient as turbines. We lose about 5% efficiency, but it gives us the ability to actually put power back up the tether and then provide thrust. So we return the wing to hover when we want to land, and then we just reel it in and land it on a perch. Uh, so here you see. I gave you a preview before, but now you can actually see the, uh, this is a prototype doing this, and we actually managed to build this prototype and test all these flight modes. You saw it just transition into crosswind flight, and, and now it's going to fly a few loops, and when it's done, when we say, okay, it's time to land, we can actually bring it back and stick it back in hover and reel it back in. So here you see it's going to slow down, and it just returns to hover right there. Now it's hovering again, and it can be reeled right back in. So that's great. We've done all the different things we have to do uh, on separate vehicles, uh, but th we're not done. Uh, we have to put it all together. And furthermore, there are other challenges that have to be solved by wind turbines. These things, they don't build them all the same because it's hard to come up with a device that's going to do better when you have perfect conditions. It's a sunny day and you have exactly 12 meters a second of wind. They build them all the same because of all the strange things you have to deal with, the big storms, the electrical outages. So one good example is high winds. Uh, and the first thing to note with this is that, okay, our system works the same as a wind turbine. That's what I've been emphasizing. So let's examine how a kite behaves in a gust uh, compared to a wind turbine. So you have some apparent wind that the kite and wind turbine are seeing. This is a combination of the speed that they're moving at and the wind uh, coming into the field. So when a gust hits, it's very hard for a wind turbine to pitch. It's very slow. The, the blades are massive. They weigh tons. Uh, and they're on these huge bearings. So with the kite, because we have a tailplane, because we designed them to be passively stable, any good aircraft designer should know, um, they pitch into the wind. They, they actually relieve load passively. And so when a gust hits, we actually don't have to deal with it as much as wind turbines do. And the first system where we really incorporated this as part of our design concept and it, uh, brought all these other uh, aspects of performance together was wing seven. We're not very creative with the naming. Um, and this wing, so this is the first wing that can do everything together. It can, it can hover, launch, and land. It can take off and land at a perch. It can transition into and out of these power generating loops, these, the crosswind flight. Uh, and it can do so in a big range of wind conditions. And here you get to see it do that. So here you see it take off from the perch. Um, 
when the wind is good, good enough to generate power, you launch it from the perch, it hovers out to full length tether, it accelerates up into crosswind flight, and then it starts generating power. And as it flies the loops, you can see it's almost perpendicular to the wind. And this is because this is the, the orientation where we can slow the wind down the most. Our goal is just to slow wind down. That's how we, we want to squeeze all the energy we can out of it. So after it flies these loops, let's say the wind gets, gets bad, or let's say we need to bring it down to do maintenance, whatever the situation is, um, then what we can do is we can actually um, bring it around and return it to hover again. And here we go, it's going to slow down and it just returns to hover right there. We reel the tether in, and then we land on the perch. And there we go. So there's a fully functional prototype. And it seems pretty great, but I should say um, things don't just happen where everything works. And this is a great example where also, we didn't say, okay, we've solved the problem, let's just build it and it's going to go. You can see in the top, uh, the uh, um, upper left-hand corner of the screen here, this is our first version of the wing. And on the lower uh, left, uh, upper left, lower right-hand corner, uh, we have a later version. And you can see it looks a little different. The pylons are different. And actually what we had was we, uh, we made a mistake. We, we designed the, the pylons in a way we didn't anticipate to be a problem, but they, they didn't work. They vastly decreased performance. And one of the philosophies we took with this wing was to build it kind of like a truck. So we make it so everything's really easy to bolt off, bolt on, uh, really simple to build, fast turnaround. And this allowed us to very quickly build a new design um, and put it on and test it and, and find that it works. And uh, so the wing we have now is absolutely phenomenal. We're very happy with the performance. So the next thing to do, obviously, is to scale up. So what we're doing next is we're starting to work on utility scale devices. Here I have in white uh, solid the wing we have now, and then the M600, the wing we're working on now. I think we're going to encounter a lot of challenges along the way as we build this wing. I think it would be foolish to say that it will be easy, and it's just a matter of uh, going from the experience we have now. But our, our secret weapon to that uh, is our team. So I have to say, this is the thing that allows us to do all these innovations and make all this progress is we have uh, a team of about 22 people who are absolutely excited to work on this project and they're not really in it for the paycheck. They're in it because they want to see a future with uh, these devices powering our grid. Um, and they're in it for the challenge that comes with uh, putting your energy into this sort of problem and after lots of perseverance seeing results. So that's, uh, that's what I wanted to say. Thank you for having me here and good night. Thank you.